my Irish doodle on the call would be in massive trouble. Um, she's just an absolute nightmare. We'll just give another minute for people to come in. Um, so people are warned, we are now live on the internet, uh, live streaming over YouTube. I've always wanted to say that, it's quite exciting. I feel like my next uh, career as a presenter um, is in the wings. Ah. Oh, I've lost everyone. All right, by my watch, it's two minutes past. Um, Joyce, are you unmuted? I can unmute, yes. Perfect. Um, so um, it's... Um, um, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm uh, Oli Amara. I'm a consultant clinical psychologist. Um, my day job is um, forensic CAMS, um, so young people in touch with the uh, criminal justice system. And then I also help out a lot on the trauma-informed care um, uh, project for um, CAMS and TUBE. Um, Joyce, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Joyce Powell. I'm also a consultant clinical psychologist. My day job is with Durham Local Authority, working predominantly with looked after children. Um, and currently I'm the trauma lead in um, CAMS across Tube. Um, so um, etiquette rules, be nice to each other. Um, use the chat function. Um, Paris, unfortunately, the way that you've set it up, I can't see the chat, so I'm gonna rely on Joyce. To monitor the chat and interrupt me when I need to stop um, and uh, use the chat function for uh, chatting about <laughs> if you can hear a crying toddler in the background that is mine um, and uh, he's probably refusing to put on clothes or something along those sort of lines um, so apologies if he runs in thinking it's hilarious and um, that has happened on numerous uh, zoom calls and so forth um, so uh, today we're uh, chatting about trauma-informed care during a pandemic, a CAMS perspective. Um, hopefully uh, giving people an opportunity to connect, touch base, um, share ideas, um, create new ideas. Um, we're, um, hopefully there's not gonna be too much new. There might, hopefully there's new ideas. Um, but it might be re-going over some old grounds. Um, so um, because we talk about trauma, so it's an emotive subject, keep yourself safe. If you need to take time out, um, please do so. Um, that is some of the benefit of uh, Zoom calls and online world is that we can just um, turn off our cameras or close our laptops. Um, and um, like I said before, um, curious questions, um, are always welcome and I'll give Joyce opportunities during the uh, chat today to pause, reflect, take anything that we're interested in. Um, and I think that's it for in terms of etiquette. Um, you're all on mute um, because that saves background noise um, and we'll probably get Joyce to ask the questions via the chat box. So hopefully that all sort of makes sense. Um, have I missed anything, Paris? No, nope, all good to go. No, awesome. Oh, and like I said before, um, this is being live streamed to uh, via YouTube and will be on the Recovery College afterwards. Um, so no swearing, and that's mainly for me. Um, so what we're gonna do today, we'll do a quick recap of trauma-informed care. We'll think about the pandemic through a trauma-informed lens. Um, we'll think about what young people have told us about their experience of the pandemic and then also what staff have told us about their experience of the pandemic and then what we've done and, and what we can do, which will probably be the interesting part. Um, and if there's anything else that people want to cover, write it in the chat and we'll try and um, come to it at the end. We've got uh, an hour together. Um, 
if we finish earlier, we finish earlier. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to run over because that's our allotted time, but we'll see how it goes. So quick recap, hopefully everyone's aware of uh, trauma-informed care, um, the, the four R's of uh, realizing um, the impact of trauma, recognizing it, responding appropriately and resisting re-traumatization and using the five pillars of safety, trust, choice, collaboration, empowerment. And I'm gonna talk a little bit later about uh, what that means and uh, the tagline being, um, not what's wrong with someone, but what's happened to them to understand um, their experience and strategies that they've used to cope with those experience. Um, now I've put in, it's not just trauma therapy because I think people can often get misrepresented around um, thinking, right, everyone needs trauma focused CBT or everyone needs EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing or other um, uh, specific trauma therapy. No, what we're talking when we're talking about trauma informed care is a real culture shift from um, uh, process driven targets to um, not repeating traumatic experiences that um, can happen in services at times. Um, hey, not yeah. just broke, but I don't know whether you're moving through a presentation here, but you're not sharing your screen at the moment. Oh, okay. Oh, is it because you're sharing the screen? No, no, I stopped it when we were in the pre-room, so you need to just re-share it again. Oh, okay. Um, why have I... <laughs> yes, sorry, I was just trying to tell you, but... <laughs> um, okay, give us a sec. Oh, that was so weird. I was clicking away with my presentation, <laughs> um, being all happy with myself, and... Uh, clearly was not. So you were missing all my amazing graphics and everything. Apologies for that. Right, so this is what you've missed so far. Um, and this makes more sense why I can see everyone now. Um, so that's our first faux pas with uh, uh, internet uh, enable facilitating. Um, so this is what we've covered so far. This is our plan. Um, this is um, infograph around uh, trauma-informed care that hopefully probably lots of people have seen previously um, in what we're talking about. And then this is what we just got onto, so don't worry, we haven't missed too much, um, around moving away from process-driven targets and seeing people as um, numbers, so to speak, or just going along um, to um, creating space to think encouraging safety, restoring power and worth. Um, and what I like is what Epstein describes as supporting reflections in place of reaction, curiosity in lieu of numbing, self-care instead of sacrifice, and collective impact rather than siloed structure. So that's why some of these webinars are really positive in terms of being able to connect with others and understand what else other people are doing. And it does create a whole culture shift in an organization to do that so we need changes in policy procedure ways of working and being with our families and young people um, uh, so when we're thinking about um, the uh, pandemic through a trauma lens um, what we're noticing is that everyone's going through a threat system at the moment um, we've got family illness we've got um, uh, uh, stress and actually it's um, going to the point of uh, chronic stress so we've been in the pandemic for 18 months now maybe longer um, and what people are describing is no escape the, mu the news is constantly full of uh, pandemic um, it seems to occur in every conversation um, and what we're noticing is due to the um, isolation that people are feeling there's re reduced connections and when we get reduced connections we get reduced resources and even though there has potentially been some reduced demands in some places it's wet depending on how people are coping at home will depend on how that balance is acting so when we think about stress and we think about 
normal positive stress of that gets us to do deadlines and stuff um, when I was writing this webinar um, and maybe tolerable stress of um, making sure I'm not doing it late last night to then thinking things that are becoming overwhelming and then when we border in the um, what professionals call toxic stress is when there's no support system around us when there's no emotionally available adult uh, to help us make sense of our experience so that we have to make sense of it um, ourselves. So what impact has this had on young people and what have they uh, told us? So um, we asked young people and there's um, a fair amount of literature out there now um, around um, young people telling lots of people are struggling, it's stressful, they're missing friends, family, the loneliness and not feeling as safe, um, lots of worries about exams and future, um, frustration, sometimes anger about the impact of the pandemic on their lives. And um, two of our young people described it really well of like some people are experiencing it like a thunderstorm at the moment and sort of like an isolated boat out there that's uh, drifting off and getting battered by waves. Um, another young person described it as uh, like two bubbles. So one which had an idealized version of the past when we could meet up with friends and see the park and everything. And then the other bubble of that uncertain future. When's this gonna end? Um, how's this gonna be? How do I make sense of all this? Which I thought were two really apt sort of descriptions of actually what is going on for everyone. Um, young people saying they're a bit all over the place some days, some days okay, some days no, no motivation and just sort of getting used to it, but then being bogged down by social media and the news and sort of saying, well, this is life. There's also the part of like that increase of time on the internet. Internet's amazing, um, but it is um, all the information in the world at your fingertips with no scaffolding or structure which is a real risk for our young, purpose, young people in terms of what they can access, um, which they can go down a rabbit hole and not realize what they're watching um, and how they make sense of it. And that's why we're talking about that uh, emotionally available adult to help them make sense of uh, what they've seen on the internet, which is sometimes hard because we don't know what they're looking at. Um, and then we wondered about, well, what about young people that have experienced um, early life adversity more than other young people or more um, present uh, or uh, more prevalent? And um, they said actually, they thought the pandemic could have created different circumstances that um, create more stress or more pressure or bring them back to uh, the trauma that they experienced when they were younger such as being stuck in the house could bring back memories or more time spent on in your own head um, and having less distraction and therefore more opportunities for uh, flashbacks or, or reliving experiences. Um, and um, a Wales study also when they were doing a survey of all, all uh, sort of thousands of young people, they noticed that actually young people that generally face barriers uh, in the system um, are struggling uh, more. So uh, young people and families with disabilities uh, are being more likely to be worried about the coronavirus, um, BME uh, populations, uh, more likely to feel lonely and more likely to say, say that they feel unsafe. So when we're thinking about trauma-informed care, we're thinking about how do we adapt our systems and responses to appreciate uh, what young people are uh, experiencing. But we also heard that it's not all uh, doom and gloom. So there were sparkly moments uh, along the way. So people saying actually they're enjoying learning at their own pace from home. Actually they're um, enjoying not having to see people and feeling less pressure. Uh, enjoying more time with family, time away from school, um, actually feeling it's calming. And I think that's a real challenge about how we understand how the young person has experienced the pandemic and how traumatizing it is. Um, and uh, 
what we appreciate or what their base level of understanding do they prefer to stay by themselves generally or do they like to spend time with uh, other young people which is obviously going to then have an impact of uh, whether um, they're enjoying lockdown or not and then we thought about okay well so that's our young people and families experience what, what about our staff experience and, and a colleague of mine Kay um, did some uh, work with our youth justice colleagues um, and came up with this nice description um, of actually what has been the thought process through the pandemic so back in March 20th so looking at the last year sort of that shock and then uh, adaptation of going okay this is a new normal and then that mm, surely it won't last too long and then oh my god it's still happening and it's still happening really still and then that feeling of that a lot of systems are having now around burnout, compassion fatigue, not having the resources or outlets that you would normally have to um, vent or let go. Um, and what people have noticed is behavioural changes, increased in irritability, frustration, uh, memory difficulties, um, Zoom fatigue um, or online fatigue. Uh, reduced intimacy, um, reduced satisfaction, um, sleep problems, um, being critical about choices uh, and mixed emotions. And what struck me about this is, again, this is no different from the young people and families that we work with, going through the same thing, noticing the same patterns. Um, and the question that I'm left with is how do we support our staff and work, workforce to process what they're going through, but I'll, I'll come on to that a bit more. So what we've noticed is, is more compassion fatigue, more burnout, more moral injury, um, more vicarious trauma. Um, so when we talk about compassion fatigue, that ability to um, have a loving kindness towards other people and when we're talking about burnout we're talking about uh, the resilience the um, resources the drive that we start to lose that um, we're tired all the time our sleep's problematic um, when we talk about moral injury we're talking about doing things that are against our values uh, so I'm being asked to um, uh, act in a way that doesn't fit with our agency and um but not feeling able to um act differently um and potentially seeing more of this in our in our health sector um and then vicarious trauma um we're hearing so many trauma stories um and it's how we're taking them on and it's filling us up and how we make sense of that um, I was struck by a couple of chats that I've had with colleagues lately um, where um, who've had experiences of COVID and lost loved ones uh, through COVID that when people are coming back from the wards or keep, people are coming back from ITU and they're sharing what's happening that they don't have the space to process it they don't they can't they know that they can't hear it because it's too triggering for their experience and um when we're thinking about our hospitals um one uh, comment that really struck me of the um how are people coping and going well we've got the crying corridor and that really felt the need for a crying corridor when things become too much and too overwhelming um, shows the level of pressure and fullness in the system that is a caring profession. So how do we then um, be caring towards others and make help other young people make sense uh, and families make sense of their experience if we're too full ourselves? So I sort of mixing my metaphors but when the bucket is full but the jug is empty how do we pour from an empty jug and we'll come on to self-care later but 
what are the things that let water out of our bucket? Uh, how do we create systems that um, don't overwhelm us, uh, don't overwhelm our young people and families, but also don't overwhelm the staff uh, that work with them? So um, quite a helpful sort of model um, that I find is a um, window of tolerance when thinking about threat. And what we've seen when we're thinking about pandemics through a trauma lens is that it's been shrinking people's windows um, because there's more stress and less coping, normal coping strategies. Um, how do we then increase our window and how do we escape going into hyper arousal, that uh, freeze response, stuck response or hyper arousal and chaos while being mindful of that some of our workforce needs to still be in crisis and rescuing mode and firefighting mode that they have to think and it's not until afterwards that they then have to make sense and fit it into their internal model of the world and that's um that's really challenging i'll uh, i'll pause it there joyce anything um any questions or reflections or anything that's coming through or if I stunned people into silence? This is always weird about like only a one way thing. Um, I haven't seen any, um, I've got the chat open. So I'm just gonna check with Paris. There's none that I'm just not seeing, but I haven't seen any. No, there's none but, No. Cool. And I, I hope that's because people are being thoughtful and reflective rather than um, it's not making any sense, but if it is not making any sense, please uh, write that into the chat as well and go, Ollie, what are you on about? Um, that's actually fine and we'll adapt. Um, so what have our um, young people said about um, uh, experiences of services? Because that's what we're sort of wondering about. How can we be trauma informed in, in current times? Um, and, um, they said well it was good not to be rushed going at my pace it was good because nobody said or challenged the way I was thinking um after a while I felt confident to chat people um it was nice because my worker knew my mum before uh we could uh chat and therefore that felt safer what they would like us to change um they asked really irrelevant stuff um uh they asked random questions and uh, young people going like what are you on about uh, I don't like being asked why all the time um, and that danger of curiosity from our uh, workforce or, or carers being um, well really important uh, when a young person doesn't have uh, an answer um, can be uh, overwhelming um, being late um, and then also um, knowing who to talk to at the right time so chatting with uh foster carers parents beforehand to get a better picture so that the young person doesn't have to repeat their story uh carers um often feeling like they have to fight for appropriate services sometimes feeling patronized not believed uh difficulty with sensitive information um sometimes a conversation being very problem saturated and that being overwhelming uh, carers and parents feeling blamed uh, workers not always recognizing the um, developmental uh, stage of uh, uh, young people and the impact of trauma um, uh, Megan Middlemas um, one of our psychologists in the service did her thesis on on uh, what it was like to um, access service for uh, people that have had developmental trauma um, and she came up with a really nice model uh, and I'm sure the thesis will be available soon I don't know whether it's been published yet um, but sort of this description of having to go in the ring with a professional boxer after you finished a mar marathon and this is what we're trying to highlight, the experience of um, trauma in the system being overwhelming and the resources that are available and then having to feel like you have to then jump through another hoop or um, go through another battle or explain your story again. 
and sort of this is what we're sort of describing for the need for trauma informed care to take a step back and appreciate what the experiences have been and how long these experiences have been going on. Um, so uh, it's a helpful model to sort of make sense. Um, but the overall themes about what what families and young people were looking for was um, calm, friendly, sensitive, empathic, um, feeling safe, uh, not going straight into solutions and problem solving, um, but actually trying to create safety and stabilization in the system, uh, building up trust, um, considering the wider system, including parents, parents for the young person, but schools and how important they are, um, empowerment being key, building on people's strengths and resilience, um, and recognizing um, endings can be really challenging. And so sort of the reflection from uh, carers and young people is like, it's not rocket science, it's what we had hoped all services to do. And therefore we be then become curious when uh, people don't act in this way or when they're too overwhelmed by stress or pressure or their own trauma that uh, thinking space is reduced. Um, and um, that's what we're wondering about in terms of our trauma-informed care, care systems is how do we increase that space for reflection um, and uh, time. So top tips from our young people, uh, what they're looking for, um, at, at, like in pandemic times, in general times, um, be predictable, be available, be consistent, answer your phone, call us back, uh, write down the right thing. Um, some young people said, actually, it'd be nice to not talk about the pandemic, try and create some normal uh, conversations and how to escape negativity to uh, bring some of the fun back. Because this is what our common theme was, is actually our, our number of positive experiences, and I don't have the research for this, but I wonder if they've been reduced. And therefore, if we're not having as many positive experiences or rewarding experiences or pleasant feelings, and we're getting this uh, blob of pandemic, how does that feel in terms of headspace? So I'll pause there. Um, Joyce, I've seen some people writing. I think they some have, people They have indeed. Um, one of the things that I'd start with is that Megan um, has submitted her thesis in, for a paper and has got through the first stage. So hopefully um, there will be a paper on that one. Um, so lots of positives um, comments about the presentation being helpful for the young people that um, people are, are working with. Um, and a comment about the fact that some children are happier at home than at school, which was certainly our experience when we were talking to our young people. So um, thinking about how we can make the transition back um, into school after having, I guess, such a long lockdown, less traumatic. Um, and I think that's the main question that we've got, um, yeah. Ali. Yeah, and um, what we're describing around our uh, systems being more reflective and um, open is also what we'd love is more um, creative and flexible. So actually what works, um, I was struck by, um, probably not that healthy to listen to Five Live all the time on, uh, on my way uh, in the car, um, but because every chat seems to be about some sort of level of pandemic, but the um, schools and um, this race towards qualifications and that not fitting with a lot of our young people and who started this race or who created this race and why, <laughs> why? Um, when we know that everyone mo moves at a different pace um, and have different needs and have different skills and strengths. So uh, I work with a lot of uh, young people that um, don't fit into the education system. Um, and uh, when it works well, the solution is creative, individual, person-centered. Um, when it doesn't work so well, um, it's the opposite. Um, so I think a really important point from um, that person around how do we get responsivity in the system that people feel empowered to do something different. Um, we'll come on to that a little bit in the, later. So 
um, what we've done so far in terms of CAMS, we've done a big emphasis on um, increasing awareness about the impact of trauma, especially it's in um, the shame narrative that's held by some of our young people. And um, for clarity, um, shame being people think they're bad rather than um, guilt where you've done a bad thing. Um, so shame, holding that uh, badness uh, within yourself and being about yourself and that being uh, dependent on the developmental age of, of young people actually if they can't make sense of how, why something bad has happened um, say sort of our really young primary school children then how to get a narrative uh, away so that they're not storing it and making it um, and storing it within themselves um, so um, Kim Golding and Dan Hughes and people that do dyadic developmental psychotherapy uh, talk a lot about the shame shield which we're thinking about uh, with regards to um, our, our services um, also thinking about trust so actually how do we go at the young, pe young person's pace how do we um, ensure consistency um, and um, understanding stress so understanding who's in available in the system to reduce those demands and also create safety um, and appreciating that um, we don't see things as they are we see things as we are so we make sense of it via our internal model and then uh, Karen Treisman work who's done a lot of uh, trauma-informed care um, sort of highlighting that every interaction is an intervention so every time that we meet a young person family colleague is an opportunity to rejuvenate refresh connect um, to give them a different experience of uh, maybe what they've had in the past or uh, what they're currently experience. And like we described earlier, um, concentrating on safety, trust, choice, co-production, empowerment. So actually uh, young people and families uh, co-producing our services, our resources, are changing our services. So what does this practically look like? Um, so getting the right person at the right time, um, uh, not getting the young person or family member to repeat their story over and over again every time they meet a new clinician. Um, and we've seen some real differences in our single point of contact or single point of access around um, our clinicians being and um, uh, getting information from uh, external sources, but then also uh, signposting to uh, appropriate clinician who would then be uh, a place to explore it further if the young person was ready. Um, I um, had, uh, because I get lots of referrals from other services, um, had a lovely experience of, uh, of a family that had experienced um, uh, significant adversity and trauma and the clinician had had a lovely conversation with the mum around how much they wanted to share versus how much is available elsewhere that can tell the story. Um, and actually we can then uh, rely on that other information so that the, we don't then re-traumatize um, and um, get desensitized uh, to the, uh, uh, for the young person and family. Uh, like sort of describe using uh, Kim Golding uh, pyramid of need, um, concentrating on uh, feeling safe physically, emotionally, and having that as our basis and understanding that that's what we need if we're going to process trauma. And if we don't have that, how do we create it? And that's not relying on one service or one person. That's a systems approach to, uh, to intervention. Um, and then once we've got a level of safety, that's alongside building uh, trusting relationships and then moving on to comfort and co-regulation and really trying to understand where our young people and families are within the system and taking the time to uh, appreciate um, what's going on and um, what their experience and how they've made sense of it and whether it's still going on. So how do you create a trauma-informed care environment, which we're going to come on to a bit now. So um, Self-care being our bedrock, um, you, like you say, can't pour from an empty jug. So our, our uh, carers 
are parents or uh, staff um, concentrating on themselves so that they know what their triggers and they're not overwhelmed, not coming to work, uh, overtired, overstressed, overpressured, uh, and understanding from all levels of the system to do that. Um, creating space to think and reflect. And uh, a big one for me is like how to create psychological safety. So psychological safety being the difference between uh, trust and, and psychological safety that others will give uh, the benefit of the doubt when people take risks or make uh, try and understand uh, the the uh, approach that the other person has gone. Um, there's some um, Google are big into psychological safety, and there's lots of other organisations that are doing it really well. Some of them have radical policies like um, no gossiping, like you can't talk about someone unless they're in the room, um, versus um, uh, radical candor, so everything's open. Um, to uh, to more practical uh, steps of feeling supported by your uh, manager, service manager, director, um, and system around you, so that there isn't uh, feelings of blame, um, which then leads to shame in the system. Um, and often people can notice whether their psychological safety in the system will, will be how the conversations are had or how people act and um, that feeling of safety with your colleagues and families. And um, when we're thinking about safe self-care, um, I was, and I still can't rem remember where I heard this from. I think I was either reading a book or listening to a podcast, um, but the different uh, between empathy and compassion and they activate different uh, pathways in our brain. So our empathy activating our pain pathway, whereas our compassion activating our reward pathway. And that being really interesting around actually we do try and promote lots of empathy, um, but then maybe that's filling up our bucket quite a lot. Whereas compassion um, might make us help with connections and uh, pouring stuff out of our bucket. And also that really important part of compassion uh, for yourself and I know that Paul did a lot of stuff around the uh, compassion series um, in the other um, uh, other webinars so I'll, I'll not go over that um, but how we treat ourselves with self-kindness and understand our own stories um, and our own triggers so that we can um, appreciate what the impact of the current environment is having on us and what impact that our relationships have on us. So we've also concentrated on um, space to think. So uh, increasing a reflective uh, practice in teams, encouraging uh, clinicians to notice their own triggers, responsive um, formulation time. Um, so actually, how do we understand with the young person and family, their journey, um, their uh, way of thinking, their outlook and light so that there can be uh, shared problem solving. Um, processing time. Um, and I've also put escape time, not like literally escape, but like actually how to not feel overwhelmed. How do you build in your system um, thinking time and privileged thinking time as much as um, doing time? Um, and that's one of the real challenges when sometimes our organisations can be very uh, results um, numbers driven and how to take a step back from that. Uh, to um, uh, to see the whole system as uh, as a whole to create uh, flexibility and like I said creativity if we don't have space to think we'll still uh, do the same thing and fall back on the same patterns that we've always done so um, one of my challenges back to all of you is um, what takes you back into your window and understanding that when we link it back to our window uh, of tolerance and again mixing my metaphors but what empties your bucket um, so actually what relieves stress what takes it out but then what fills up your jug so actually what are the things that make you feel good about yourself so that you can go into work or you go into uh, your family um, or whatever you um, do um, that means that you can be compassionate towards people that you can give resources um, 
and uh, another article I was reading was um, about um, uh, you gain wealth through giving. Um, it was describing a um, instant of um, uh, his dad uh, borrowing sugar off uh, a neighbour and uh, this uh, young person was going, why do you borrow sugar off the neighbour? We've got loads of sugar at home. And uh, the, uh, the dad said, well, um, because then it feels he's then more likely to accept help. And actually, he's then more likely to then uh, take on more from us. And it doesn't feel um, like um, pity or charity which I thought was quite interesting in terms of our uh, narrative of, of helping. So what does the future look like? And I don't know where I got this from either. Um, I'm not being great with my referencing today, um, but um, I thought it was quite a nice model around what's happening currently in society um, that we had the threat, although it seemed to happen quite quickly, maybe some people were more informed about it uh, than other words. Um, and then we've had this heroic uh, response um, from our health sector, from people in general around coping. And then um, what they've noticed after, uh, so this models around what happens after significant disasters um, is um, we get a level of community and then we drop and there'll be anniversaries, which will be triggering events. There'll be uh, second waves of what happens in the next um, winter or everything. Um, and that leading to a level of disillusionary and then the uh, restructuring. And I suppose the one of the questions uh, that I'm left thinking about is how do we create systems that uh, have space and understanding passions for that. Um, another um, uh, conversation that I had with colleagues was, again, the difference between empathy and compassion um, of uh, our health workers um, not always having space to think about how other people are coping and when everyone's firefighting and in it together and then some people aren't in that place that that can lead us to an us and them narrative or it can lead us to a blaming narrative if we don't take time to appreciate and be compassionate so how do we take a step back and realize that everyone's on their own journey how do we take a step back and realize that everyone has their own resources and stresses and everyone's window will be different everyone's bucket will be different sizes everyone's jug will be different sizes Maybe I need to water the garden. I don't know why I keep on going about these, um, uh, these metaphors, but they sort of work in my head. Um, so what needs to change? Um, that is over to you guys. Um, like, what's the thing that um, you need to do um, in your household or in your head or in your organization? Um, to um, create more uh, trauma-informed systems. Um, and one of the questions I'm left with, how can we make connections? Because if we're in a disconnected society currently, how do we then reconnect or link up to um, be with others? Um, so one of the things I would say is that um, you are braver than you believe. Um, um, I've stolen this um, as well. Um, and um, actually, how do we challenge some of our systems uh, to put ourselves out there to say things are um, different? And nobody has all the answers. That's why we have each other. Um, so that bit around connecting um, and understanding is... Um, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger did a really nice talk about uh, self-made man and it being an absolute myth. I think it's on YouTube, um, if any, he's a big Arnie fan. Um, but that myth of like that he did it all himself and that was only said is, is rubbish. He had so many people to help him. And that's the thing that um, uh, made him great. Um, so how do we um, get our tribe 
together to support each other uh, to um, create a, I don't know what metaphor, net, web, um, to um, create change. So that's the, that's the end of me talking. I probably talked longer than I intended. Apologies if you have my toddler in the background or the doorbell going. Um, but uh, questions, reflections, did any of it not make sense? Um, and I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll stop sharing. And I've stunned everyone into silence again. Um, all people are furiously typing away. Um, <laughs> Being psychologists, we can normally wait out awkward silences quite well as well. Um, the comment about um, the difference between empathy and compassion, um, and you know, it's really relating to that, um, and that being a really important um, distinction for for clinicians. Um, and also a comment that um, that one of our young people thought it was very inspiring, which I think is really important. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, um, also someone thinking about feeling quite concerned about their daughter going back to school um, and maybe some of the things we talked about today being really helpful in thinking about how you approach that because often as parents and carers that you become real advocates, don't you, for the, for the young people. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, another, another person talking about um, a particular challenge for um, a client who has OCD um, and, and that worry, that is actually something that we've seen because of obviously there's so much discussion about washing your hands keeping things clean and that causes its um its own really individual challenges um yeah and, and a question ollie will this presentation be available to view again i i i'm just going to say ollie it might even be for paris as i understand it it gets um put onto the recovery college um as a something you can lis listen to um Yeah, that's my understanding. And I think we didn't touch on the level of anxiety in the system or the impact on that on young people's health around contamination risk and uh, and so forth. And we didn't touch on um, people that have diagnosis of uh, autism or learning disability that, um, that have struggled to make sense of the pandemic. So struggle to like, it's been, because it, it is still an abstract concept. So I think that's, that's a really important um, really important point around um, uh, whether we'll see an increase in uh, referrals or there'll be a need for help. We also didn't talk that much around loss and grief and lots yeah. of people have lost loved ones and uh, that again will be an uh, impact on um, again anniversaries and uh, changings, changes in family uh, and so forth so I think that will be um, uh, uh, really important for people to hold in mind um, and I realized at the end of this that I went right questions like thing like without creating any space for thinking um, so I sort of didn't follow my own rules there so um, I'm hoping like people have talked about there's uh, it's been thought provoking or at least has created some sort of level of curiosity uh, in people that can um, that they can take back and have things uh, thinking time with their um, with their own systems, whether that be family or organisations or teams. Um, a couple more comments. Claire's confirmed that the webinars are available through the Recovery College online. Um, and got another couple of comments there. Um, Giles is interested in the concept of an emotionally available adult. What do young people say about how they recognise whether an adult is emotionally available? If I was to think about the answer to that, I think our young people are very tuned into us and they they really know, they, they suss you out. You can't um, we'll pull the wool over their eyes at all. And the other thing is about trust. It's really important to um, have that 
trusting relationship. I'm just mindful of, we might go back to that, but there's another question there about how um, have we built in that really important space and reflective time into um, our individual teams working day um, and this person works in an IAP service and it's a major barrier um, and absolutely I can speak for the service I'm in that um, one of the reflections that a lot of people have made in having to adapt to an online world is that actually we've been able to be a lot more efficient at times which has meant that we've had practically back-to-back -back appointments and meetings um, which means that we see lots more people, but doesn't give us that reflective space in the context of being isolated from the rest of the team and the usual, very natural kind of um, kind of support that you give that, yes, you can ring up a colleague, but it's not quite the same because you don't do that in the same way as you would if there was a colleague just across the corridor or just across the way that you would just share and and I think that's been a massive um that sort of fragmentation has been really massive for people um, and also carers and parents as well because the support networks and the things that they normally do um aren't available so yeah that would I don't know is anything else for you Holly yeah so in answer to to both those questions um the emotionally available adult comes from like uh, Peter Vonnegut's work um who's uh, down at the Anna Freud Centre um, so if you Google that and Peter Vonnegut, and um, I think there's a couple of papers that come out around the uh, protective qualities of emotionally available adult. I agree with Joyce um, that um, young people are normally very attuned and um, young people who have experienced, experienced uh, significant trauma um, are often um, very attuned to who are non-judgmental and accepting. Um, and who's available versus who maybe is um, more focused on change. And I think that's one of the key things around uh, emotionally availables of taking that DDP stance of uh, acceptance and being with um, and uh, being non-judgmental to then create space to think about different possibilities. Um, and so whereas uh, some... Uh, systems can go in with uh, a very solution focused change angle um, of like this is what needs to change then our young people can often then close down and become more rigid to that um, uh, to that threat that they think is um, potentially some of their strategies have been very helpful and protective in the past therefore trying to get uh, lots of change might be too um, threatening in terms of the um, uh, building in reflective capacity and services, um, buy-in from senior management, um, even really high levels, directors and people to, um, uh, to value it. Um, in my team, we have a case discussion booked in monthly, we have reflective practice booked in monthly, and the, I do reflective practice for other teams that, have, um, that value it and prioritize it. Um, and the, I suppose the encouragement that I would give is to uh, raise the argument of that this is as important as face-to-face um, -face client work. Um, because if you're not looking after yourself and processing, then um, that's when we um, close down our thinking. Um, I know we're mindful of time, but there's another comment um, from Chloe, who is discussing the um, her role in education. Um, and um, let me just have a look. Um, she says, help, she says, as part of the curriculum, my role is being highlighted more by, I think, a speech and language therapist to help re-engage, signpost, and help out these students struggling with post-COVID trauma. Um, like your pyramid of need, I know colleagues in education use the Maslow's hierarchy of need. There's an educational version. I've seen that looking at holistic view of clients, motivations and decision making around careers advice um, and provide, um, sits further down the priority list at the moment as people are unable to see past the pandemic. And I think that is a problem, isn't it, that with a lot of areas that because the pandemic has become such a big thing, it's almost like a barrier 
to thinking in and, and, and brings in uncertainty about everything. So all our young people who are looking towards the future have got that sort of um, personal uncertainty alongside all the uncertainty that the, um, the pandemic brings as well. Yeah, and I think this balancing between uh, qualifications and, and well-being um, uh, is really important. Of there, there are some really positive stories from schools that they're um, uh, concentrating very much on the well-being um, and the reconnecting and the uh, uh, not rehabilitation, but that sort of uh, theme of like they're slowing down the process. I'm probably seeing that more in primary schools than secondary schools. Um, but I think the conflict when people are in different stages, so when they're doing the GCSEs or A-levels of how do we help create space and take a step back from those things. Um, so I think, that I, yeah, and again, is how do we challenge the system slightly, be a little bit rebellious um, to, um, to ask the difficult questions of, of um, decision makers and, um, offer alternative solutions to that. Um, I've just seen another, I'm aware of time. Should we yes, I think, we're, I think we're about three minutes um, yeah. to, to, yeah. And um, Lucy has said she um, works with people with physical health issues, um, says that think, thinks a lot about the clients with complex physical health issues in hospital who felt much more connected with teachers during online teaching and less different from peers. I've actually, I can parallel that with looked after young people who found that easier um, and fa felt that they've been able to manage and, um, and, and if they've had any school related anxieties have been able to sort of manage those better and being in the same boat as other, other young people. And I think that sort of harks back to the uh, creative solutions of like actually finding what fits and actually how do we um, have models that adapt to the needs of uh, the young people and families that, that we work with. Um, so I think it's a, a really important point that Lucy makes. Um, we've run out of time uh, today. Um, I hope that's been uh, helpful in terms of connecting and, um, and thinking time. Um, the, uh, it will be on YouTube um, and the PowerPoint presentation will be, or slides will be on, um, on the Recovery College. Um, so good luck, go forth, challenge, inspire, uh, reflect. Um, yeah, take care.